Sunday, Hopeland Church. We are so excited that you guys are joining us today. My name is Jocelyn. And I'm Cynthia. And if you're new, um, we want to stay connected with you. So text the word new to 323-405-3232. We are expecting God to move today through this service, through the worship, and through the awesome word that's going to be shared. So please go ahead and share this service with your family and your friends as well so that they're blessed also. Go ahead and enjoy the service. Enjoy the service.
get up now and ride Ooh. And up from these ashes Let new life be born Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It all depends on when you're jumping on here, uh, but um, it is good to be here. I was gonna say good to see everybody, but um, you see me, but I don't necessarily see you. But um, uh, stoked you're here. 
We're in part two of family. We're going to continue uh, with family, but specifically continue from last week on the family of God and just go a little deeper into what, how it looks. I think last week we talked about the family of God and kind of what is it, what, what is it by definition, but now we're going to see how does the family of God operate? How does this, how, how does the family of God actually look? Um, and, and, and what are the functions of that family and, and, and the things that we as a family of God do? And so here we go. Let's do this. All right. So I'm going to pray here and, and then we're going to jump right in today. Um, I hope you enjoyed worship. Um, and, um, hey, if you're on here, um, share this with somebody. If this ministers to you and if it's ministering to you, um, share this with somebody, um, send it to somebody, DM it, send the link, whatever, whatever it is, whether it's the, um, the actual service, or even if you're listening to this on our podcast, um, yeah, if, if this really does speak to you and you know, somebody that would benefit from this, that this would minister to them. Um, yeah, please share that with them. Um, so let's pray this morning. Uh, father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, this moment. Um, we thank you for this, this moment, this, this privilege, this opportunity to um, receive from your word today. Uh, God, I pray that you, Jesus, would open up our understanding, uh, Lord, so we can, so we can see uh, the word, so we can receive something in the spirit from you that would make us stronger in faith. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen, amen. All right, here we go. Here we go. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. We're talking about the family of God today. And I am really excited uh, this month. Um, as you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verse 49, uh, my wife and I, Crystal Gale and I, are going to be speaking together. We're going to be speaking together um, on the 27th. So um, two weeks from this service today, we're going to be speaking together, but we're going to be speaking specifically about the literal, you know, biological family, the, the home, and just really just share some of the things that we um, have learned and are learning and some of the things we do to um, build and promote healthy marriage, healthy home, he healthy parenting, all that good stuff. So we are really looking forward to that, uh, doing that together. So that is coming in a couple weeks. All right, Luke chapter two, verse 49. And he said to them, this is Jesus. Um, why did you seek me? Because he was in the temple hanging out with the with, with the folks reading the Bible, reading the word of God, and um, they were looking for him. He says, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Um, and I'm just kind of continuing even from last week. This is really kind of like specifically part two of the family of God. Um, if we were to subtitle this today, it'd be the family of God. Um, but um, here it is right here. Uh, Jesus is in the temple. And he's associated himself with the Father, Father God, his spiritual father, his 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 God and his father, right? Um, and he's associating that relationship as 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 um, having some sort of mandate and call. So, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? So, as we dive into this today, and as we kind of unpack the family of God a little bit further. Just go a little bit deeper into how we see it working and operating, even in the book of Acts, that with the family of God, we must not lose sight of the fact that we aren't just some family for the sake of family alone, okay? That we just are um, connected to one another in Christ, um, and, and you know, th there it is, right? Um, and... Uh, but with that comes the call to um, be about the father's business, that there is this mandate on the family of God in the earth that we have work to do. 
we have, um, you know, people to minister to and uh, neighborhoods to minister to and cities to, uh, you know, reach out to and, and people to love um, unconditionally. So this thing of the family of God is a, is a mandate, okay? I wanted to start with that because now when we read this, you're gonna see kind of how that looks. What does that mandate really look like? What does the family of God really do for people, right? What does, what does um, Christian community, what does local church community, what does the global church do, really do? What, what is that mandate? And I know uh, there's so many uh, elements to this, but we're gonna really just uncover uh, just a couple verses in Acts and really talk about that today, okay? So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter two. I'm gonna read from verse 41 to 42, just two verses. And this really kind of encapsulates um, what the family of God really looked like from um, antiquity, from the literal early church. We're talking first century now. Um, only, now this was happening literally 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Literally, it's on the day of Pentecost and you see how this family, this new family in the earth, the church was birthed. Um, this is after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And he sent the Holy Spirit to the 120 people that were waiting in the upper room. They were tearing and they were waiting to be endued with power from on high. Peter's filled with the Holy Ghost. He stands up and begins to preach. And after this message he preached, the Bible talks specifically and immediately about how this new family is operating, okay? So here we are, um, Acts 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word. What word? The word that Peter just preached. Were baptized. I love this. Those, those, plural, those. It's plural, it's people. It's not just one person, but it was a people that received the word of God and were immediately baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers, okay? And so, man, this is, there's just so much here. Um, I, I taught a class, actually, on the book of Acts, and I taught a class on the early church um, at, the, at TCMI, um, Teen Challenge Ministry Institute. And literally, that, that, that one study on Acts, which is basically a study of the church, of what does the church really look like, and just, um, uh, and th it, that class was literally based on these two verses. This is how it looks. The methods might be different. The approach to this might be different, but this is the church in operation, if you will. This is the church as, as she, the bride of Christ mobilizes, engages on the day to day. This is what she looks like. This is the family of God right here. This is the household of faith, right? This is God's people. This is the saints in the earth. Those that are born again, receive the word, they're baptized. What does that tell you? They heard that word, they received it. These people got saved. And what did they do? They get baptized. Now baptism is a sacrament, it's sacred. There's something about it that is holy and awesome and we do it today. But to be honest with you, um, it was different culturally and contextually then. They were literally risking their lives to do that. This was like, I am signing up for this. And uh, baptism was no joke in the early church, okay? So, so it, it carried more weight, meaning there was more at risk for them, okay? And, and so this is what happened. They received the word. They're like, look, here's, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I, my life is his and here we go, right? So they get baptized and that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Man. That's an amazing, amazing moment right there. And here it is, verse 42. We're gonna kind of hang out here for the rest of today in the word, but verse 42, Acts 2, it says, and they. I love that. It's plural. It's speaking of community. It's speaking of a people. They continued steadfastly. Okay, and then it's named some things they can continued steadfastly in. 
All right, so here's here is my first point, folks, is, is they continued steadfastly in these things, okay? So here it is. My first point is this. Community is worth fighting for, okay? Community, God's family, is worth fighting for. And, and speaking of the family of God, um, it's, it's, th- th- this is the context. This is how, this was the posture. This was the spirit of these people that this is something they continued steadfastly in there. It takes resilience to stay in community. And we're going to talk about this. It takes resilience to engage in the family of God. It takes resilience to continue. It takes resilience to remain. It takes resilience. This is what it is. If you've ever felt any resistance in engaging in God's family, in, in being a part of God's family and serving and loving the people, in God's family, God's people. Our last point last week was what? Let's be good to God's people. N- know that, that that's not a strange thing that that resistance might be there at times. It's not a strange thing that maybe you've even been offended or embittered by people in God's family. That is not a strange thing. That is very much a normal thing, meaning that we all experience that. But this is my encouragement to you is to press in to the family of God and stay connected to the body, be as the early church was. They continued, continued steadfastly in these things, okay? And so in this verse, I'm gonna read verse 42 again, but, and they continued steadfastly in what? These are the things that make up the family of God. These are the bedrock. These are, these are foundation pieces in the family of God. Okay, so here they are, and they continue steadfastly in what? Apostles' doctrine. Come on, somebody say that with me. Say the apostles' doctrine. Second thing, fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. All right, the next thing, in the breaking of bread. Everybody say, everybody say food, okay? Um, and in prayers. Everybody say prayers. And so um, these are the things. The, the family of God consists of these elements, okay? The, the, this, this is the family of God in operation. In, 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 in the rhythm of life, this, these things must be an element, must be a piece of how you walk with God, okay? This, this is requisite. These, these are foundational. We, we don't pick and choose which one we like more than the other. And uh, me as a pastor, if there are any pastors out there listening to this, we don't have the right to pick and choose which ones we want to kind of focus on more, right? Like, like the, this is Christian community right here, okay? This is it. If, if these, any of these are lacking, we need to strengthen those areas. If any of these elements are are, are missing, then spiritual leaders need to make adjustments and, and make an effort to, because this, this is what and who we are in practice, okay? So here they are, the family, and I kind of, uh, we're gonna talk about these uh, four things, but the family of God consists of what? Here they are, I'm gonna say them a different way and then we're gonna kind of go through some points here, but the family of God consists of, okay, the first thing here, apostles' doctrine or spiritual authority, is there when you look at Christian community? If you, if, if if Christian community were a box and you open it up, spiritual authority needs to be in there. It's not some loosey goosey, anything goes kind of thing. There, there are people called in local church community on different levels or however that community is structured or set up that there is somebody and people responsible. There is authority. There is, that, 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 that is a piece, okay? The next thing, fellowship. Like fellowship is in there. We're gonna talk about fellowship. If you open the box, if Christian community, local church community, we're, we're a box. If you open it, spiritual authority needs to be in there. Uh, fellowship needs to be in there, okay? This is another piece, the third one which I really love this, that God put this right in the middle of all of these very deep, profound spiritual elements. He also put like the breaking of bread. 
And we're going to read another verse where it talks about um, that they ate food with, with gladness. So it's like, so in this is number three. This is the way I worded it. The practical things of life are enjoyed. That in Christian community, this is part, and we're going to talk more about that. Because it says they broke bread and they ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And so there is this thing here. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. And then the last one here, it says prayer, but this is the, the language I'm putting to this, is a collective pursuit of God. This, these, this is Christian community right here, folks. Let me, let me say them again. Let me say them again. According to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, what does the church look like in practice and function? It's these four things right here. Spiritual authority, fellowship, the practical things of life are enjoyed together, and there is a collective pursuit of God. You could read anywhere in Acts, and 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 because the Acts is is literally the the one narrative we have that has been canonized as as the Word of God that tells us how life as a Christ follower in community is done. And you will see these things there. You will see these principles there. And, and, and for you and I to grow and develop, this, this is part, this is what it means to be in Christ and to be baptized into the body and to be a part of the household of faith and the family of God. All right, so, so here's my next point. We're gonna talk about each of these one by one. We're gonna talk about spiritual authority because it says they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. It doesn't just say the word, although yes, the word, but here when it's talking about community because it talks about a bunch of people that heard the word, accepted Christ, got baptized, and then based on their encounter with God, they began to walk in freedom together, walk with God together, and it says that they were continuing steadfastly and submitting to the apostles' doctrine, or what is that? That is spiritual authority and the teaching of the word of God from somebody that you can say, that is my pastor. Doesn't mean you don't listen to other pastors, doesn't even mean you don't, you, you, you aren't a part of the lives of other people outside of that local church, but that these people were like, man, this is who I am listening to. This is my church. That is my pastor. Okay. And so that, that was there. So here's the next point. Spiritual authority is a blessing. This is part of the family of God. Okay. And I know when we hear the word authority, sometimes it's hard for us to digest. I was abused as a child, and I understand about the about how authority used their authority to abuse and violate and harm me as a child. So I understand the process of needing to, to be healed from that. And I, I was sharing with some friends on this Bible study. I got... Uh, some friends in the skateboard industry and we come from the skateboard industry and the world of skateboarding and I teach once a month at a Bible study that's kind of this gathering of skaters and those in the industry and or just, you know, it's just a community of people that are kind of involved in that world. And I was sharing with them about just uh, the blessing of having pastors in my journey and just that authority, being under that authority just Man, and that, that, that covering and that prayer, and it's been a blessing to my life. And I, I, I mentioned to them, I said, look, the, the abuse of authority does not um, take away the need for authority. Okay, somebody might abuse it, but just because somebody abused it doesn't mean I don't need it. Amen? And just because somebody, um, there is an abuse of power or authority, that doesn't mean that authority itself doesn't mean it's not of God. Authority is of God. And the devil, uh, you know, um, twists it to harm people, but God uses it to bless people. The purpose of authority in the kingdom and in the house of God is to bless. That's, that's why 
Authority is there. That's why it's there. It's to be a blessing. It's to be a blessing. At the end of the day, spiritual authority from a biblical perspective is always there to be a blessing to those that are in that community. God uses authority to bless. These people got saved. And what did that authority do at that time? Peter was one of them. So he preached to them, but then they came underneath his teaching. They came underneath. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That language is specifying people like they were submitted in a community where the word of God was taught. It's associating the teaching of the word. And it, this isn't the only way God teaches us, but it is a way that God teaches us. And it is through spiritual authority, through those that we say, man, that, that is my pastor, okay? And so some of the language associated with healthy church leadership is this, is covering, affirmation, challenge, release, activation, and blessing. Once again, guys, spiritual authority is a blessing. Submitting to the word of God through somebody else isn't always easy, but God's intention for it is blessing. I would not be where I'm at if I did not have pastors in my life, especially at the time of when I first got saved. Just that, what I mean by especially then is because I even had friends on this, when I was teaching this Bible study, I was talking just about the blessing of having a pastor and being in community and identifying with that community. And in and, and, and whatever season you're in, like you're in community, you're, you're in the house of God, you, you're, you're, you're a part of the body, you are engaging with the local body. Like we, 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 we need the body. That's how, that's, we're, we're only a piece. We are only a part. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We need each other in the body. And, and, um, my friend asked me, man, Sean, like we know somewhat about your past. Um, because after I teach, you know, it's kind of, you got to do a little Q and A and he's like, dude, you were, we know kind of how you were, how authority treated you as a child. And then you come from the skateboard world, which skateboard world, especially when I was growing up and just the kind of culture I inherited from them and from that world and passed on to those, you know, that were around me, um, is, was just, it's rebellious. It's just, that's what it is. Like anti everything, right? Um, against the grain, everything, right? And just rebellious. And so he's like, how, how were you able to just at that age, getting saved even as a teenager and kind of coming underneath your pastors and serving and receiving from them and being blessed by them and sent by them into what you've been called to do? And I'm like, man, that is a good question. And um, I, I would say it's two things. One is I encountered Jesus. And so when we come to Jesus, I mean, uh, the language in scripture that associates salvation, that is associated with salvation is, is very strong if you think about it. Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I mean, you, and, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I mean, the confession of our mouth is very strong and heavy. We're saying Jesus is Lord. We are, we are voicing allegiance to the Lord Jesus. Our confession is we are submitting to the authority of God. I mean, that's what it says. If you confess the Lord, the Lord Jesus. And so I, I believe it was the revelation of Jesus and that, wow, I, I am now under his lordship. But I would say the, uh, and so that started it because then I start to see that how this applies to um, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord as the, as the word says. Um, and, uh, and then my pastors really uh, taught on it. They, they taught on this principle and how God operates in and through authority to bless, to cover, to affirm, to release, to activate, and to send. And I experienced all that. I experienced all that, okay? And so here, I, I just wanna pull some verses here that 
that you see how authority and family are, are one and the same in the kingdom. That they're one and the same. The, the authority in the kingdom of God is not a dictator. It's not a power hungry thing. It's not a domineering thing at all. Because the language of authority in the word of God, when you speak of Christian community, it's directly and it is confirmed multiple times in the scripture, the language of authority in the scripture is associated with the language of family, okay? So let's look at this, all right? So 1 Thessalonians chapter two, verse 10 to 12. And as you're turning there, 1 Thessalonians chapter two, 10 to 12, I'm telling you guys, if you get this, this is a, a biblical principle. This is a kingdom principle. There is power in being connected and a part of community. And when you are, there is a blessing in being connected to some sort of spiritual authority. Okay, this, this, is, this is how God works, how God blesses. It's not always easy. And I've had, I've had my challenging moments of being under authority. But many times, can I be honest? If I'm honest, Many times those challenging moments were my own pride, my ego, my rebellion, um, my hurt kind of manifesting, um, my, my fear of submitting to somebody in the Lord. I mean, the Bible speaks of even the home that there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's authority, that the husband is head of the wife. And that authority is required and responsible to love the wife as Christ loved the church. And there is a responsibility on headship. There is a weight, there is accountability that, you know, pastors will give account to God in eternity for those that were under their care. And, and, and if that doesn't put the fear of God in pastors, um, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned because it should. It should put a concern, it should put a, a reverence for God and a, and a weightiness and a carefulness to how we lead and pastor people because we will be accountable. We will be held accountable, okay? But here we go, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, you are witnesses in God also how dev devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. So Paul, um, he was part of starting the church in Thessalonica, He's now writing a letter because he was there and they, the persecution happened and he had to kind of dip out. And so he sent Timothy to see how they were doing. And Timothy came back and told them, told Paul, hey, they're doing great. He, it was a good report of their growth. And so this letter is a result of what Timothy told him, okay? And so uh, justly and blamelessly, we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Verse 11, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. As a father does his own children. Somebody say family. Verse 12, why? Why was he this way? Why? Verse 12 it tells us why. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Okay? Um, fathers are present and engaged for those under their care. So when we start talking about authority, in the kingdom, we must immediately and, and communicate what the motive and the heart and the approach is. And it's like a father cares for his children. It is not the same exactly, right? Because that's weird, right? You get what I'm saying? But it is like that. What? How is it like that? That the spiritual authority is present and engaged for those under their care spiritually, present and engaged. Not aloof, not missing, not absent, not about their own agenda, not trying to build their ministry, not trying to build their following so they can write more books. Nothing wrong with writing books, but that is not what spiritual authority is. Spiritual authority is like a father to his children. How? And Paul writes, if you wanna see this, I think, I think Thessalonians is a great example of this because he words this 
uh, another time. We're going to read more from Thessalonians. It's, it's, this, this, this tells you a lot of how Paul's heart broke for these people as a father's heart breaks for his children. This is healthy spiritual authority, okay? And so here it is. Here, what's another way? Like, how is this like a father? Because, I mean, he says it here that, verse 11, 1 Thessalonians 2, 11, as you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you. As a father does his own children. Fathers are present and engaged and engaged for those under their care. So here's another one that's just a practical way of seeing how does this correlate, Pastor Sean? Apostle, father, pastor, father. How does that really work? How do we look at the biological family and we kind of relate that to the spiritual family? It's at the core of a father's heart. Okay, I got three kids, biological. But at the core of a father's heart is this. I am here for you. Okay, like that. That, there it is, okay? I know that sounds basic, but that is what pastoring is. That is what authority is. I am here for you, okay? And here's another way to word it. What I do, think about a father now. What a father does in the rhythm of his life, and if he were to look at his children and they say, like, what does a father do? Here it is. What I do is for you. It's what it is. It's what it is, okay? Here, another correlation here in the word of God is Paul called both. Now, these are biological sons. He called Timothy and Titus sons in the faith, okay? Called them sons, sons in the faith, okay? Now, let's turn to another verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Let's look at this once again. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. And it reads, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I've begotten you through the gospel. Okay, why don't you have many fathers? Because it costs more to be a father than a teacher. Somebody say amen. Fathers don't live for themselves. That's what this is. True, healthy, biblical, spiritual authority. It, it is men and women in positions of authority that are there not for themselves. They're not there for themselves. They're not there for themselves. This is um, true calling from God to lead in Christian community is, is, is self-denial. That's a father, okay? I got three kids. And so my wife and I would tell you, you know, when you start having kids, your life is no longer your own, right? It's not about you. And so why, 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 why is, why are, why is father, why are spiritual fathers rare? Because it costs more to be a father. It costs more. It costs more. It doesn't cost much to be an instructor. Okay. You, he's like, man, you got 10,000 people that are going to teach you something, but you ain't got many fathers that are willing to lay down their life for you. And, and that, that Jesus models this, right? He says the good shepherd, what? lays down his life for the sheep. All right, let's look at another one here. I'm gonna move quickly now. First Thessalonians chapter two, again, first Thessalonians two, seven and eight. Here we go. Here it is. Here's another, here, here, here it is. This is spiritual authority, the family of God, Christian community. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother. Everybody say family. So as a nursing mother cherishes her children, okay? Verse eight, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us, okay? So the family of God is not just about the message of the gospel. Anybody can pick up a Bible and, and preach the message. Hear what I'm saying? But he said, Paul said, I didn't only give you the gospel. It wasn't just, I'm not in your life just to give you a message. I'm not in your life just to give you a sermon. I'm not in your life just to give you five points and a poem. 
He said, look, man, th th this thing, this church, this Lanaika, I didn't just give you the gospel, but we gave you our own lives. So, so it, it is a life that exudes the quality of the message we preach that makes the difference. We like, you know, every religion in this world has a message, but God for pastors, spiritual leaders, it's more than the message alone. Community needs your heart and soul. That's what Paul said. That's what Paul said. Look at your Bible, folks. Look at the Bible. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God. That is our message. But when it comes to community and the family of God and spiritual authority, there is more required of spiritual authority than a Sunday message. Then a sermon series, he said, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, in one version says, our own lives, because you had become dear to us. This is the family of God in operation. This is spiritual authority doing what they're called to do, not only preaching a word, not only teaching the scripture, but giving your life for these people. Our heart must break for the people we deliver the message to. If all you've got is a message and your heart doesn't break for them, there's a problem. Pastor, man of God, woman of God. Come on now. We, if, you know, I, I've met pastors where, they love to preach and teach, but they ain't trying to get involved in people's lives. And then they start to equate their spiritual gift to something that somehow, for some reason, I think they've taken way too many personality assessments and that they've allowed personality assessments to get them out of truly being involved and caring and pastoring people. Come on now. Come on now, somebody say amen. Let's not use personality profiles and as an excuse to avoid sometimes the unpleasant things that come with spiritual leadership and authority. Somebody say amen. Our heart must break for the people we deliver the message to. Let's not just give people the gospel. Let's give them our lives. It's worth it. They are worth it. They are worth it. All right, the next one, my next point is we need the Christ in others. So right in there in Acts chapter two, all right, it says, you know, they, they, they continue steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine, spiritual authority, the teaching of the word. And um, the next thing was fellowship. And we need the Christ in others. This is the family of God. The uh, fellowship, the word fellowship in the Greek is koinonia, which is a spiritual exchange. Um, this is what it means. It's um, the emphasis of this word is, is two things. It is spiritual. Okay, it is spiritual. I know sometimes we talk about um, fellowship and we kind of use that word a lot or, or, or community and it, we associate it with kind of social interaction. And it, it, and it obviously it happens in that. But, but really, it's, it's really this mysterious kind of thing. It, it's, it's this exchange we have in the spirit with other believers. It's this true spiritual um, commonality, okay? The emphasis is spiritual fellowship, okay? And it also stresses the relational aspect of the fellowship. So this word koinonia is spiritual and it is relational. It is people sharing in the spirit what God's telling you. Maybe you have a word, maybe it, or maybe it's just the condition of the people of God, their spiritual state, the Christ in them, that by being around them and among them, you are blessed. So we need the Christ in others, and they need the Christ 
in us. Okay, this is what it means, koinonia, a participant who mutually belongs and shares in life with others. So this, this, this is what it is. This, is. this is the family of God. This ought to happen, that, that you could be, maybe you're struggling with something, maybe you're walking through something, you get around believers, you get in an environment I don't care if it's on Zoom, if it's in person, if it's over coffee or tea or lunch or just coming to the house of God even on the weekend, on a Sunday, and it's, it's, it's the koinonia. It, 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 this, is, this is something in the spirit, the spirit of God, that we are blessed and washed and, and cleansed and, and, and healed and, and encouraged and challenged. I, I mean, that all those wonderful things that happen to our soul in the company of other believers. It's fellowship, koinonia. Okay, here's the next one. It says there that uh, there was the breaking of bread. Okay, and I know some uh, theologians and early, um, you know, and historians and stuff, sometimes they associate that with communion. Um, but, 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 um, and I get that, but I believe it's saying not just that or speaking of that because, and if it was, then it's really from a Jewish context because at this point, the church was predominantly Jewish and Jewish led, okay? So that, I mean, the church in Jerusalem was a Jewish led church and they were still practicing certain things. So communion to them, you know, what we would call the Lord's Supper was actually a Jewish feast and it was an actual dinner. So if, if that's what they were talking about, it was a literal dinner with food, okay? So, but look at Acts chapter two, verse 46. It just kind of goes along with this. Later on in Acts two, it says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Look at this. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So here's the next point once again, is that life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is meant to be enjoyed. And I believe sometimes we miss this. Sometimes people get into God, they start following the Lord and everything around the corner is some kind of demon trying to attack them. Every moment is some super intense cause. Everything is just over the top. Every they, they, they over-spiritualize everything. And I believe in some ways, it's in innocence and ignorance. Um, but in the early church, you see that there were, there were these, these, these deep, profound, spiritual things happening. But in the midst of all of this, that these people were able to kick it, eat some food, and enjoy one another's company. And this, 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 this is important, that life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is meant to be enjoyed and not everything is spiritual. Not everything is an angel. Not everything is a demon. Not everything, not all of our life is not an absolute total spiritual war, okay? And in the kingdom of God, I believe in our faith and in community, I believe that local church community can bring a balance to life. That, 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 that this thing must be enjoyed. You know, um, here's, the, here's the distinction that creation is not evil, right? This natural world is not of the devil. God created it. So it is meant to be enjoyed, okay? And I believe people that maybe come off hyper-spiritual or uber-religious is that maybe it's their fear that these things would begin to try to satisfy them or they're going to get worldly. And I understand that. Uh, but here's the distinction that this created world is meant to be enjoyed or God would not have created it and he would not have called it good when he created it. But it isn't there to satisfy us. I think we just need to know ourselves, okay, these things in life are meant to be enjoyed, but they aren't meant to satisfy me. Only Jesus satisfies, but everything he's created in this natural world. You know, in, in the context of, of, of 
of the fruit of the Spirit and the standard of holiness, right? That it is meant to be enjoyed. It is meant to be enjoyed because these folks, they had a lot of stuff going on spiritually, powerful stuff happening. But man, they were able to hang out, eat some food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Not every, I, I think sometimes people just, in their efforts to please God, and maybe they have this distorted thing of needing to please others, that they hyper-spiritualize and they get confusing and complicated and super deep. And it's like, man, just look at the scripture. They ate, this is Acts 2.46. They ate their food. <laughs> Somebody say that. Anybody like food out there? But they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Hallelujah. And the last thing, last thing on that list there, I'm gonna read Acts again one more time. Acts chapter two, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, spiritual authority. And fellowship, all right, we need the Christ in each other. The breaking of bread, life is meant to be enjoyed and in prayers. And this is my last point, that we're a praying family. I really believe with all of my heart that sometimes even in, in, in you know, I'm a pastor, so I'm around pastors and 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 and, and you know, trying to learn how to do this thing called pastoring and learning from other churches and even, you know, organizations that have formed in Christendom to help pastors do what they do. And I believe with all of my heart sometimes, um, it's, maybe it's just in our Western world here that we have so many um, things out there to help pastors how to quote unquote grow their church. But I feel like we're missing some of these just practical things that aren't necessarily about growing the quantity of people in your community. I, 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 I really feel a strong conviction in my heart, my wife and I, of the responsibility of discipling and being a part of people actually growing in their faith. Okay, I'm not against our community growing numerically. I'm not against it, but it is not the North Star. It is not at the top of our prayer list. There are people that have called this place home and not, we feel the weight, the responsibility, and we enjoy the journey of discipling and being a part of the individual's spiritual growth. So um, I think we all know this, but prayer is a big deal, all right? And it's on the list here. And, and so we're, we're, we're a praying family, okay? The house of God ought to be a place that people pray and they learn how to pray. And they learn how to pray. That is the family of God. That when people come in, this might all be new, but man, that they, they, they ought to learn how to pray. Christian community ought to be a place where you learn how to pray and it ought to help you have a stronger prayer life. Amen? Hallelujah. We're, we are, we're a praying family. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, today for everybody that's joined in. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of people. I pray, Lord, this, was, this is our prayer this year, God for our community. Our prayer, God, is that people receive prophetic vision, prophetic revelation, and th that they would hear your voice and that people would grow in faith and the roots would go deeper. So I just thank you, Lord, that even this message and this sermon we're going through, the family of God, is our prayer is that this helps with those things, that their roots go deeper, that, that, they, that they become blessed even more so by the spiritual authority over them in the Lord. Those that are serving and ministering to them the word and, 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 and leading them in, in, in spiritual things. God, I pray in Jesus' name, Father God, that we would be a community of people that fight for community, that we would continue steadfastly in these things. I pray for your grace to continue, your grace. God, grace us to be steadfast. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for spiritual uh, authority being a blessing to us. God, I pray in Jesus' name, God, for everybody here that, that they this year would receive from the Christ in others, that we would have a mutual participation 
and a mutual exchange uh, and impartation of the Christ in each other. God, I pray that we would learn even in, Lord, our, our, our pursuit of you and in the, the spiritual dynamics of what it means to follow you and walk with you, God, that we would be a people that know how to enjoy life. <laughs> Lord, that we would just learn how to enjoy being together, hanging out, and enjoying the things in this created world. God, I pray that we would learn how to eat food with gladness and simplicity of heart in the name of Jesus. And God, I just pray that anybody that would call this place Hopeland, their church home, that they would learn how to pray this year and that their prayer life would get stronger than ever. And I pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have not confessed Jesus to be Lord, if you are not saved, if you're not walking with God, if you know in your heart, your life, you're not right with God, you can do that right now. I just wanna lead you in a prayer of accepting him, acknowledging him as your Lord and um, receiving the forgiveness of your sins. And so pray this with me, folks. Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner, forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Based on your grace, God, and my faith in you, I am saved. I am forgiven. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I know that seems maybe extremely simple, but that is what faith in God is. That is what the beginning of walking with God is, is, is acknowledging who he is in your condition and, and allowing him to forgive and to heal and to fill your life with his presence. And so if you wanna grow in faith, I wanna send you a Bible study. We'll text it to you. So to receive that, it's a seven day Bible study on just taking steps and walking with God. Um, and just text the word grow, G-R-O-W, to the number on the screen, text grow to 323-405-3232, and we'll send that right to you. God bless you. Congratulations. Man, what a powerful message that was. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, but we are now entering uh, the transition into tithe and offering. So before we get started with that, I just want to thank everyone that's uh, continued to give to this church. Uh, we are so grateful for that. The, the, like, please know that we are, we are super appreciative and we just praise God for your, your, your hearts to give. Um, if you do want to give, there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, you can text the word Hopeland to the number on the screen. Um, and you can also uh, give through Venmo, which is uh, one of the ways I like to give. Uh, the uh, name you search is Hopeland-Church. Um, I do have a, a message I want to share with you guys today, a scripture, sorry. Uh, it comes from Philippians 4, it's the New King James, uh, Philippians 4, verse 19. It says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Um, like many verses uh, when it comes to give, God just giving us all that he gives us, um, this is another verse that I, I love and I always think about um, uh, when me and my wife uh, got married, this is something I shared with her a, a lot and I still do. I, I just, I have these times where um, I reflect on all that God has done for not just me, but now our family. Um, and I just think about like how far he's brought me and just always constantly providing me specifically with like work, for example. And I'm just, I'm so grateful for that because that, uh, when, it's been part of my journey in uh, wanting to tithe even more because everything that I that he's given me it's it just given me more uh, of an excitement and a joy and a desire to want to give back because it, it's all his at the end of the day you know and so when, when it comes to like the the work I have and the industry I'm in it's such a blessing in itself it's like why why not give why, why wouldn't I want to, to give back I mean he, he just continues to give more and I don't do it to uh to receive you know i just do it because i'm like he, he, i'm provided he provides for me and my family and i, I just i want to 
You know, I want to I want to give him back just as much as he's given. And I know that's hard because God gives us everything. I can never give him, you know, the same amount. But it's just that desire and that willingness to want to just trust him more than anything, and just give out of the out of the trust in my heart uh, to him, my, the love in my heart I have for for God. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray. Um, Father God, thank you so much again for another uh, awesome message. And right now, I just want to pray specifically for those. Um, in need, those who are, are um, maybe going through something, whether it's financial or just any sort of hardships, just lift them up, Lord, and just pray for uh, peace and comfort in their hearts, praying that whatever situation, whatever season they're in, that this is the time that you could use this to uh, guide them and bring them, draw them closer to you, Lord. Bring them uh, uh, into a, a place where they want to give more of themselves to you. Uh, ultimately, any of those who haven't been saved, it, it could be a situation where they, they find you and give uh, their life to you and you know, find salvation to their situation. Lord. I just pray for those who are continuing to walk faithfully and are, are seeking you daily that you continue to strengthen them, give them peace, give them um, uh, uh, courage and encouragement with others and, and just through your word. And I just pray that you lead us all as we go out this week, protect us, guide us, bless us with travel and mercy, Lord, wherever we may be and bring us back here. Uh, uh, the next Sunday, Lord. We just thank you, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us, and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday. Hey, Hopeland family, Pastor CG here. I hope you guys are having an awesome service, an awesome Sunday today. I have two announcements for you. This one you've been hearing um, for the last couple weeks. We've been encouraging our Hopeland Church family to sign up for our family meeting. What is it? This is where we get together. We talk about our successes, the things that that um, we did together as a church family over the last year. Um, we look at our finances. If you're giving to this church, you have a right to know where the money is going. Um, we wanna share that with you. And then also we are looking at 2022. What has God spoken to our hearts about this year? How can you get involved? Um, it's going to be exciting. So please RSVP for this. Um, the only way you're going to be able to attend is if you RSVP. It's not an open meeting. This is just for Hopeland Church family. So you guys know what to do. All you have to do is text family to 323-405-3232. If you don't have that number in your phone yet, put it in your phone. In fact, pick up your phone right now and just text family to 323-405-3232 um, to RSVP and we will get that link to you so you can be a part of that meeting. It shouldn't be longer than an hour, but we're gonna share our heart with you for 2022 and we really want you to be there. Second announcement is Faith Foundation. So I don't know if we've mentioned this before, we might have mentioned it maybe in passing, um, but Faith Foundations, um, it's the beginning of something awesome this year. Uh, a few things I want to share with you about it and why it's important for our community. But um, my husband and I, Pastor Sean and I, as we were praying and fasting this year, we were really um, focused on a few things. You guys know what our prayer focus was for the year. I'm not going to go through that right now. But we really believe that God spoke to us about what we need to do for our community this year. Um, our heart is to see you grow in faith. That's pretty much where we are. And we want you to grow in the study of the word and in prayer. This is what Faith Foundations is all about. Who is it for? It's for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a baby Christian or you've been serving God for a really long time. This is for you. The content will be a reflection of everyone's faith journey. It doesn't matter where you are in your journey. Um, this will be for you. The way we're developing this and creating this should touch you wherever you are in your walk with the Lord. It's really important for us to begin the year with some foundation that we can build on and grow on. And we really want you to attend. If you serve in this community, if you call this community your home, um, this is for you. So what's next? We are gonna actually have an info night because it's something new for our community. We wanna be very clear about what it is what to expect and how you can prepare for it. So we're actually gonna have an info night. Normally what we do is, we'll normally start the year off with hope groups, but instead of hope groups this year, we're starting with faith foundations. So this is for everyone. 
So what we want you to do is text the word faith to our number, the number on the screen, just text the word faith. It'll put you in that group. So when we have our info meeting, we'll send you the details um, and then you can come and attend and find out exactly what it's about. We're in the process of developing and curating the, the, um, the information for this. And um, I'm excited because God's really spoken to our hearts specifically on how to unfold this and how to teach this to our community. So if that's you, you wanna begin this year strong, I encourage you to sign up for Faith Foundations. Just text the word faith to the number on the screen. Love you guys. We hope that you guys enjoyed the service. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you for joining and please stay up to date with everything Hopeland. Go ahead and follow us on social media. I'd like to close you guys out today with a prayer, so please close your eyes and bow your heads. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for today's service. I hope that we all took something out of it today. I pray that we can all grow closer to you, Lord, and that we can apply what we have learned. I pray that everyone has a blessed week and that they all stay safe. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. I never take 11 minutes. Just so you have it. Sweetie. Okay. Can you just let your husband eat it? Can you change his diapers, please? Thank you. <clears throat>